everyone, welcome back to Health Healthcare. We are moving now to H741, an act relating to health insurance coverage for colorectal cancer screening. So we had um, the sponsor of the bill come in before break, and we had legislative counsel walk through the bill. So we're now going to hear from all the various stakeholders um, about their thoughts on it. So we're going to turn it over to Sebastian. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sebastian Arguendo for the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, I love the new space. It's <laughs> very light and airy, and Claire gets her own office. Right. <laughs> Don't get used to it. We're moving. Uh, <laughs> and we would not be able to see your whiteboard from here. Right. So. Yes. Yes. Um, so... I am here to talk briefly about uh, the language in uh, H741. Um, in general, the department um, supports the idea of um, extending coverage to uh, diagnostic um, colorectal cancer um, tests, um, but we just wanted to raise one concern with the particular language okay. in the bill. So um, I was going to share it on Zoom. That would be great. Um, it is. Oh, okay. In the wrong lobby. And if, if I'm on my phone, it's only because I'm taking notes there because my computer has died. So. Yeah. I need to think I'm not paying attention. <laughs> I will join the correct Zoom lobby so I can share my screen. I don't think it'll work on this. It's okay, Topper. I'm good. Okay. Um, the language that the department is concerned about is um, right here, which is um, linking the statute with the most recently published recommendations established by the American Cancer Society. Um, the reason that we're concerned with this language is that the Affordable Care Act um, has a preventative services mandate that is linked to the current recommendations of the United States Preventative Services mm -hmm. Task Force. And, um, our concern is that um, if there is ever in the future a substantial divergence in those recommendations between the ACS and the US uh, PSTF, that um, those services that are indicated in the ACF, ACS um, recommendations uh, could be considered a new service that is um, subject to state deferring. Wow. And um, I just wanted to show that um, the recommendations right now are very similar. So the, these are the US Preventative Services Task Force recommendations. And um, as you can see, um, tests like colonoscopies, uh, CT colonographies, and um, sigmoidoscopies are um, every 10 years for the colonoscopies, um, every five years for the colonography, and every five years for the uh, sigmoidoscopy. And um, it is the same period for um, the American Cancer Society guidelines, but again, our concern is just in the future if the ACS adopts new recommendations and the um, Preventative Services Task Force does not. Um, the last thing that I wanted to raise, and this is mainly for um, the benefit of the committee, is that um, the 
law in Vermont has another category for individuals that are at high risk <laughs> uh, colorectal cancer um, that allows for coverage of um, tests at more frequent intervals as directed by um, the member's physician. So that's this language here. So I can't see that part. So can you just tell me what page? I just probably still won't be able to see. Can you tell me page page and number? Yes. So this is the language that's already in law. Okay. Um, on page three, line eleven, insureds who are at high risk of colorectal cancer um, have screening exams and laboratory tests covered as recommended by their treating physician. So. Okay, with, uh, with that, I will um, stop and take any questions from the committee. Alyssa and then Art. Um, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, their A and B ratings, where do they, where do they get those from? Did they get them from sort of like the medical societies? Yeah. So and their lag time? That's a great question. And um, the sources of their recommendations are in the recommendation um, document, which is available um, on the Department of Health and Human Services website. It's a, it's a whole um, research paper that has multiple, multiple studies uh, cited. And I've, I've submitted uh, this document from the Preventative Services Task Force um, as part of my testimony today. Do we know when this one is from, 2021? Yes. This one is from um, 2021. And th this is the most recent recommendation from the Preventative Services Task Force. Art? Yes, could you go back? Uh, uh, boy, I forget your name. <laughs> there we go. Uh, to, the, to page three, line 11. Yep. And I apologize, I don't have my stuff. I wasn't prepared here. Yeah, that that wording and verbiage would would that cover the intent of the bill? That verbiage there. Um, screening examinations and um, laboratory tests. Um, my understanding is that. Um, <laughs> The intent of the bill is to address a difference in billing between um, screening examinations and um, diagnostic examinations. And um, so the short answer to your question is uh, no. Cool. Um, this just allows screening examinations at more frequent intervals than um, the Preventative Services Task Force or the American Cancer Society recommends. Which means they would be covered or that's... Yes, which means that screening examinations um, would be covered. But if you were to just use this language, that would exclude um, diagnostic examinations. And um, in brief, the difference between a screening examination and a diagnostic examination is... Um, when you're being screened for a condition, um, there's no evidence. Okay, yeah. gotcha. When you're, yeah, a diagnostic yeah. exam is, yeah. Um, yeah. we have some evidence that something might be wrong and we want to see what it is. So, so there's no language in statute that addresses that. Right. All right. So that, uh, that is, as, as I understand it, the intent of this bill. Yeah, all right, gotcha. All right. Okay. I'm glad you brought that point up because that is not how I read the intent. So can you direct me to where you're seeing that? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the um, insured who is at average risk. So that would still be, con so that would be considered diagnostic, not screening? I'm sorry. Yes, screening. Okay. 
So we're expanding my, screening. Uh, my my apologies. I, yeah. I was I was um thinking of the tomorrow. bill we're talking about tomorrow too. Okay. That was, okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So this is expanding screening, not by age, but by risk factor. Yes. Okay. Great. Brian. Yeah, that I just want to add to make sure I, I if I had to summarize this, we are expanding coverage of yeah. Screening for colorectal cancer. Yes. With no cost sharing. Yes. And right now, what is the right now? What is the policy? <clears throat> so um, fifty years old. Yes. But it's but the current policy is it that we cover all screening with no cost sharing over fifty, or is there cost sharing? Right. So the the current policy, what it if if you have in commercial insurance, what is happening now is that insurers are following the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommendations for um, these screening colonoscopies to determine whether or not they're covered without um, member cost sharing as a preventative service. So um, what's happening in effect is that the, uh, the language of the Affordable Care Act is overriding um, the language that is in our statute. So under, I just want to understand the difference this would make really clearly, like yeah. under current policy, somebody um, over the, people over the age of 50 are eligible for some kind of coverage. However, if they're underinsured, that might be, there might be a barrier. And under this policy change by eliminating cost sharing, regardless of their in, insurance status, like their insurance plan, they would they would have no cost sharing. Yeah, the the policy change um, would be to effectively lower the age, age at yeah. which um, yeah. individuals are who are not at high risk for um, colorectal cancer um, to access those um, screening colonoscopies at no cost sharing. Okay, so currently, if you're above a certain age, there is no cost sharing. It would just right. lower. Okay, thank you. That's this is what I wanted to get. At. Fifty and above, yes. there's no cost sharing. Currently, right. All right, thank you. That's so, what I wanted to clarify. So I just want to clarify. So this, the language says, for an insured who is at average risk, you're equating that to an age, though, or are we looking at a risk, or are we looking at both? So um, average risk um, is not. Um, defined by age, it's effectively anyone who is not high risk. And the um, <laughs> criteria for being at high risk are in uh, subsection C on page three, um, lines 16 through 20. So family medical history, prior occurrence polyps, or prior occurrence of uh, conditions such as Crohn's disease. So for that classification, we are at high risk. You can get a screening at no cost share. Yes. Today. Today. And as, as often as is recommended by your physician. And if you are an, an average risk, we need this language to include that group of people who is anyone other than someone in high risk. It has nothing to do with age. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you said bring it down to 45, yeah. you know, confused by that statement. Yes. So, um, if you look to the language on line three that is um, struck from the statute, um, the law as written um, limits um, screening for those who are at average risk to insureds aged 50 or older. And we're getting rid of that. Yes. Okay. Alyssa. But again, that is not how um, insurers are um, processing claims because they are following the um, language in the Affordable Care Act, which is federal law. But that was my question is, it doesn't matter if we have 50 in there, they have to follow the Affordable Care Act, which right. is a level B. So therefore, they must cover it to 45, starting at 45. Right. So do we need? So do we need any? Do we need this? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's not. Let's wait till the cross blue shield comes up, and then we. So, 
but go ahead. Technically, no. However, if for whatever reason, if, if the Affordable Care Act were to be um, repealed or if the preventative services mandate were found unconstitutional, then um, this language would absolutely be relevant. Yeah. Okay. Which we're used to that. We've done this before. We've done yeah. this before. <laughs> <laughs> Should we change, though, the language established by the American Cancer Society yes. to established by the U.S. US Preventative, Preventative Service yes. Board? Okay. That would be the department's recommendation. Okay. All right. Did you have another question? Yeah, well, I, 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 we talk about no cost share. Is that in here somewhere? Yep. Um, so, um, it's in subsection D, which is on page four. So that's a green. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Not subject to any copay, deductible, coinsurance, or other cost sharing requirements. If you contract with the insurer, shall not be subject to any. Does that, does that apply to everybody? Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Any other questions for Sebastian? All right. Thank you so much. So I've made, made the note about the change in language. I kind of do. Okay, go ahead. I don't know if someone else asked it, though. Go ahead. Because I'm trying to process it. So if I if, if so, I'm sorry. But why, why, um, why can you, if you said it, if you said it already, can you just say it again, simply for me, like why you would recommend replacing the American Cancer Society recommendations with the other groups? Yes. Um, so the reason is that um, because the Affordable Care Act uh, preventative services mandate is um, pegged to the recommendations of the preventative services task force, um, there is the possibility, however remote, that um, the Cancer Society would adopt recommendations that are different than the preventative services task force in which case um, there's the risk that um, whatever services are different um, may be subject to um, state defrayal. They, they would be considered in effect. Oh, yes, I remember you saying this. State mandate. Right. I remember you saying this earlier. Thank you. Yes, I remember that now. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Okay. Yes. Alex, I think you're online. Are you there? I am. Good afternoon. We see your love. There you are. There we go. Can can you guys hear and see me all right? Yes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Alex McCracken. I'm the Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs for the Department of Vermont Health Access. Uh, I will be very brief today. Um, Diva is very supportive of the intent behind this bill, uh, the expansion of uh, preventative coverage and screening for colorectal cancer is very much in line with the department's mission and priorities. Um, we have one note that we'd like to make on the bill as drafted, um, and that is uh, on the final page, uh, the effective dates uh, are listed as written uh, for January 1st, 2025 for all health insurance plans issued on or after that date. Uh, the plan design for 2025 has already been uh, completed, so we would need uh, we would ask this date to be pushed to January 1st, 2026 for plan design. Okay. Um, that is uh, really our only substantial note on the bill as written at this time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or provide uh, or run feedback back to the department for additional input. Um, but I, I don't have anything else to add uh, at this point in time. And thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Any questions for Alex? That was fast. Thank you. Happy to help. Thank you so Thank much. You. Good afternoon. Sarah Teachout, uh, Government Relations with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, and with the change that um, DFR recommended, switching from the American Cancer Society <laughs> to the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendations, we wholly support this bill. Um, we already comply with this, and this is already the way that we are implementing um, this benefit. So um, I can answer questions if you have any, um, but we're actually fine with the effective date as it is. You're fine with the effective date. Yeah. <clears throat> any questions? Um, 
I, I think I do. Um, I, first of all, I want to apologize. I was absent the day that you all discussed yep. this, but I had thought the bill included something else, and maybe I'm wrong, but I wanted to know what Blue Cross Blue Shield does currently. So if somebody has a oh, yeah. um, positive fecal, the um, IGOP, Cologuard, you know, and then they test positive for that. And you, usually the recommendation is that you then move to a colonoscopy. And I had thought that there were coverage issues around then covering the colonoscopy as preventative, that it was being covered as diagnostic. Right. Um, what does Blue Cross do on that? Do you all cover it as preventative? We cover it as preventative. Okay. Okay. I, I'm not sure if every insurer does it, but that's the how we are doing it. And I thought there was something in the US preventative task force about covering that. About covering that. Ends, but I would have to look again. Okay. See what it says. Okay. So. And then, can I just clarify? Sorry, can I just sure. clarify? You're okay with the 125 start date, or you went the we're one? Fine with okay. This. Sorry. And we're already doing it. You're already it's doing it. Our... Okay. Um, hold on, Art. Yep, yep. No. Alex, are you still there? Hi, oh, yes, I am still here. What, do you, what does Diva Medicaid do for the question Alyssa just asked? As far as what we cover currently? Yeah. All right. Uh, I would need to get an answer uh, more specifically on that front, but I believe that what we do currently is in line with the bill. Okay. Uh, all right, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Alex. I'm, I'm trying to determine in my mind uh, how, how this changes anything than what we do. If physicians can can recommend, okay, so a physician could recommend someone to have this anyway, right? So right. Correct me if I'm wrong, whoever might be around. The way the language is, is today, a physician can do that for a high risk. Okay, so now we're saying that anybody, anybody, so even if you have no thought of it but you just want to get it done i don't know why you'd feel that way but <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> if, you, if you just wanted to get it done you could get it done is that what this says um sarah teach with blue cross i yes. don't think that's quite accurate okay so what it says is for a person who is average risk we're going to follow the u.s preventative services task force recommendations All right. For someone who's high risk, their physician makes the decision. Gotcha. Okay. So there, it's two groups of people. Yeah, two groups of people. And good. Thank you. Alice. The guideline for average risk. I think it's down to 45. Yeah. Yeah. 45. Okay. Any other questions for Sarah? And so for those 45 and above at the average risk, then they could do the Cologuard. And if it's needed, a colonoscopy after it's still preventative. Correct. Okay. okay. That's how Blue Cross is reading it. Okay. So the collar guard has to be performed. No, I mean, no, no it can go right there. You and your physician shoes. Yeah. yeah join right. us. <laughs> You're going to join me. <laughs> <laughs> no, to I'm not trying to pick it apart. I, I get it. I just, but I do want to understand. Sebastian uh, Arduango again for the uh, Department of Financial Regulation. So um, the collar guard. Is it a conclusive test sure. for the presence of colorectal cancer? So um, in 2020, when more and more people started um, getting the Coligar test, we updated Insurance Bulletin 207, which outlines the department's reading of the statute to say that um, follow-up screenings that follow an inconclusive test are also screening colonoscopies that should process without member cost sharing. Okay. All right. That help? Yeah. All, right. All right. Any other questions for the cost through shield or DFR? Okay. Thank you. Oh, oh Leslie, sorry. Leslie, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Sorry. Um, I'm just wondering some something like Cologuard can be ordered by a non physician clinician. And throughout this bill, it only says physician. So I'm just wondering how that how that squares. I um, I don't have the language in front of me, but I believe that. Oh, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I believe that um, the department has always viewed the word physician to um, be broad um, in that it, the physician, as that term is used in the statute, uh, doesn't need to be uh, an MD. It could be a, a nurse practitioner or whoever is treating that member. I'm, I'm not sure that makes sense. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but I'm not sure it makes sense. So something I would like to think about. To the, to the extent that um, you're suggesting changing the language uh, uh, to by the, the treating provider as opposed to the treating physician, I, I don't think the department would object to that. Well, clearly colonoscopies are done by physicians, but there are other screening tests ordered by non-physician providers. So I'm not sure exactly where that might need to be addressed, but I'm just curious about that. So Sebastian, you would be okay with, what did you just say? Wait, Provider or yeah, clinician. By, clinician by might changing be okay. the, the word uh, physician on page three, um, to the the member the individual's provider or um, clinician or um, a term that would capture what we're capture the whole universe of healthcare providers. So we'll ask we'll get with Ledge Council on that. Um, Sarah, would you? I mean, that's fine. Okay, we'll put language okay. back out. Are you good, Leslie? Yes. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. So, and I apologize, Jill's going to go, Topper's going to take over. I have a meeting I have to get to. Jill's, Jill's the last one. Jill's the last one. Hi. Jill said health care not medical society. And I'll just, it's pretty brief. We support this legislat legislation. Um, we actually learned about the age being in the statute in 2022, and we thought that that didn't make a lot of sense, um, just because these recommendations change a lot. And so, um, yeah, it had been brought to us, and we actually put language in. There's a Senate bill that we have in right now, and we have it connected to the USPSTF recommendations. Actually, the language we have says those recommendations or or the least restrictive, um, just because there are a lot of um, different changes. And um, so that was what we thought it was, was really changing the um, provision to take the age out of the statute. We think that that is meaningful and a good um, step. Um, it's basically what I'm here to say. And we support more screening and more eligibility. Vermont has a very um, high rate of colorectal cancer, and it's the second leading um, cancer death risk for Vermonters. So. so, so what you're saying, Jill, is you want to keep age out of? Yeah. So right. Because you think that's least restrictive. And we say, you know, take the age out so that you can follow the recommendations um, from the, the guidance. So USPSTF is fine with us. Um, we think American Cancer Society is a little bit, um, you know, they were at age 45 before USPSTF went to that. And it took some time for the, the data to catch up. Um, but for us, um, it's really the age out of the statute, which is important. Any questions of Jill? I have just one question. How about frequency? Uh, we took age out. It, as I remember it, it was ever supposed to be every 10 years. You you got a colonoscopy. Yeah, that's in yeah, that's yeah. in the statute. And, and that's still in there and that's still valid. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, it's okay. It looks like it's taken out. All right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I have one question. I, and I apologize for asking this because I don't think you're going to know, but I'm thinking about dueling societies. The American Association of Gastroenterologists 
what are they recommending? And they support 45. 45. It's actually like so who came first, I guess? Cancer Society, Gastroenterology. I mean Cancer Society <laughs> indicated. Okay. So how long after the Cancer Society? Three years after then the gastroenterologist said. And three years after US Preventative Task Force said. least restrictive might be too, but it sounds like it's connected to the ACA and so there, there's risk there. Okay. All set? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. So that wraps it up for today. Did a wonderful job tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Any topper. We all agree. Or should we say legislative topper? Tomorrow, uh, the 13th, 9 o'clock. The, in the committee room. In the committee room. Good. Okay.